Hi, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us again for our usual Friday providers COVID-19 update from the Tennessee Department of Health. Um, I'm here uh, in the State Health Operations Center at TDH. I'm Dr. Michelle Fiscus. I'm the medical director of the Tennessee Immunization and Vaccine Preventable Disease Program. And with me is Dr. Mary Margaret Phil, who is a pediatrician and internal medicine physician and one of our medical epidemiologists. And uh, we're happy that you're taking a little bit of time with us today to learn um, a little bit uh, around what's been going on with COVID in the state and the country, as well as some uh, resources that we hope that you'll find valuable today. So we're gonna do something a little bit different and uh, make this a little bit interactive with you today. So if you can go uh, either on your computer or your phone to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com, um, you'll see at the top of the screen that there's a number to enter, which is 59, 91, 54. And we'll have some polls that you're able to participate in so that we can find out a little bit more about who's tuning into these webinars and also um, what kinds of challenges you might be experiencing um, in your own situations. So uh, again, go to www.menti.com, enter 59954, and you'll see questions pop up um, through the course of the webinar for you to answer. So uh, this is us, and uh, we'll be here with you for the next hour. At the end of the presentation, as we've done in previous weeks, we will answer your questions. So if you have questions during the course of the, inter uh, during the, course of the webinar, you are welcome to enter those into the chat box, and uh, Dr. Phil and I will do our best to answer those in the second half of the webinar. Um, just a reminder here that this is a rapidly changing situation, and so uh, guidance that we give you today might be quickly outdated. We always encourage that you check either our website at www.tn.gov health and click on the COVID banner at the top in yellow, or check with the cdc.gov coronavirus website to make sure that the information that you have is the most up-to-date. And I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Phil. Hi, everybody. Can you tell you a little bit about what's happening right now. Yeah, so first I just want to talk a bit about communication. So as always, we want to ensure that everyone has um, the ability to get a hold of us or our proxies and Metro and Regional Health Departments across the state with whatever questions that they have outside of these weekly webinars that are happening. So just to give everyone sort of an update by the numbers, so our State Health Operations Center has been activated since January the 15th, 2020. That means we have been in ICS structure since uh, for 79 days. And although it seems like much longer, it's only been 29 days since our first case was identified in Tennessee. We continue to operate a clinician call line out of the State Health Operations Center. There are folks available here from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time, seven days a week. And then there is on-call and overnight coverage for emergencies. So for routine questions around testing, um, things that are not urgent, we ask that you call during that 8 a. to 8 p. time period. Um, but if you have other issues or things unrelated to COVID, a possible measles case or other questions, the, the world keeps turning, we do still have coverage overnight um, and outside those times. So outside of our clinician call line, there are also many public information lines that have been set up. So as you can see here, there are two operated through the Department of Health and the Unified Command here at the state level. And then many of our metropolitan jurisdictions have set up their own public information lines. So um, these are great options for non-clinically specific questions, um, numbers that you can provide your patients or folks in your community if they have more general questions about coronavirus um, and what, what steps they need to take. Uh, we do continue to send out periodic Tennessee Health Alert Network messages. Uh, to, to reach healthcare providers across the state the best that we can, we try to utilize um, the licensing email list. So if you are a licensed physician in Tennessee, we ask that you update your email with licensure. You can do it at the link shown here because that's the list that we pull from to send out these messages. We're averaging about one a week or so, um, but uh, there will always be more coming and this is a great way to try to ensure that you have the most up-to-date information. So here's our first mentee question. We first just want to know who, who's out there. Um, so it looks like primarily outpatient clinicians, uh, some inpatient folks, and then a couple of administrators, nurses, and others. So as always, welcome. Thanks for joining. Um, we hope that these are useful uh, for everyone to have a Q&A and get updates on the most relevant guidance. Okay, so your next, your next question should have popped up. So we want to know a little bit about how you are 
Um, so if you can give us an indication, and wh what this will do is show us um, by uh, the answers that were put in the first slide, how folks are feeling um, with respect to their particular role in this response. You know, I think we certainly recognize within our own team, and we have no doubt the stress and strain that frontline clinicians are under dealing with this response, with trying to take care of your patients and your communities and your families and yourselves. And so we did want to share a few resources just around that idea of support and mental health and uh, and trying to ensure that folks don't feel like they're out there on an island without, without a, a network to support them. So there is um, something called the Physician Support Line. It's a free, confidential, peer support telehealth line by volunteer psychiatrists in the United States. You can just go to the link that's here on the website and, um, and they will connect you with a volunteer psychiatrist to um, provide consultation and guidance. Um, and they're available basically uh, multiple hours of the day, 8 a.m. to 12 a.m., seven days a week. So that's a really nice free resource available for folks. Another one that many of you may already be familiar with is an app called Headspace. Headspace is actually offering free um, uh, subscriptions to, to physicians. And, uh, you can just go to their website or just Google Headspace Physician Subscription, and you just have to enter a little bit of information, uh, your last name and your NPI number, and it will link to your account and provide you free access. So even if you already have a Headspace account, um, it'll link to your existing account and provide you that free access to all of their availability. Um, and it has information about meditation and sleep and just simple quick exercises, breathing that you can do to, to try to refocus and get a little bit of clarity. Uh, there is also some information that came out recently from the Small Business Administration um, around some loans that are small business loans that are part of the COVID federal response. Um, we are not experts in this, but did want to make sure that folks are at least um, aware that it exists. It's a loan uh, that people can use to pay for payroll costs, interest on mortgage, rent, and utilities. And as long as at least 75% um, of the forgiven amount is being used for, for payroll, then the loan will be fully forgiven. So a great option for especially outpatient clinicians who have their own practices and a, much of the stress and strain that goes with that right now. And then the last piece that I wanted to talk about is really just a national and Tennessee specific situation update. So as Dr. Fiscus already said, these data are already outdated, but um, are some of the most recent. So this is national data from CDC as of April 1st. You can see the distribution of cases across the country. And then um, this is sort of a, a proxy epi curve, the cumulative total number of cases in the country um, by report date. Um, when we look more specifically in Tennessee, um, you can go to the next slide, we, um, we post our numbers every single day at 2 p.m. Central Time, and that can be accessed through our tan.gov slash health page. There's a banner with a link to our COVID-19 website, and that's where you can find our numbers. Uh, but as of yesterday, we had um, 2,845 cases and 32 deaths identified across the state. This is an epi curve for our cases in Tennessee, which we're looking at by specimen collection date. So um, we, we expect that cases um, that have been tested most recently may not yet have been reported to us. So we expect that those numbers that seem lower in the last couple of days will fill in um, over the, the coming days as we get that data more completely. And then when we look at the breakdown by county, we certainly see more of a density of cases in our, our metropolitan areas in Nashville and Memphis, but um, all but 10 of our counties have at least one case identified, um, and we certainly expect that there are cases everywhere across the state um, and have certainly, and not surprisingly, seen more and more identified as testing has become more widely available. We also do surveillance for influenza-like illness really around the year, um, although flu season fortunately is uh, flu positive um, tests are starting to decline. Um, this is a helpful proxy for us and also looking at just cases of respiratory illness around the state and country. So the red line that you see on this graph is reports of influenza-like illness from clinicians um, that participate in our Sentinel provider network across the state. And you can see our sort of normal high peak that occurred during true flu season in December and January. And then we've had a decline, but in the last couple of weeks, sort of an upswing in those numbers again. And this is a, really a proxy indicator for us potentially of COVID-19 cases in the state. Um, just a plug for our Sentinel provider network, the people that help provide this critically important data for us during flu season and during situations like this. 
every year. Um, these are volunteer practices across the state that provide specimens and data for us on influenza-like illness that they see in their practices during flu season. And this is really a critical part of influenza surveillance and, as we just said, surveillance for new and novel respiratory pathogens as well. So we are always looking for more volunteers for the SPN and you can volunteer or learn more information by reaching out to the epidemiologist that runs that program, Cassandra Jones. And then the last thing to touch on is just about travel notices from CDC. Uh, so certainly a few weeks ago, we were all very focused on where travelers may have been coming from um, in Southeast Asia or Europe or other parts of the world with much more widespread disease in the United States now. This is probably not quite as important, but still uh, important for people to have awareness on. So there are continuing level three travel advisories um, for China, Iran, most of Europe, uh, and then the United Kingdom and Ireland. And that means that basically um, all but all tr all travel um, should should be restricted to those areas unless absolutely essential. Um, we do also have a new travel notice from CDC earlier this week, basically a domestic travel advisory. Um, residents of New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut were asked to avoid all non-essential domestic travel for a 14-day period, uh, just around the density of cases in that part of the country. Okay, so here's uh, another um ask of you and that is to give us some indication of how your supplies are looking so do you have uh, enough sanitizer surgical masks and 95 masks gloves and gowns and the these are slide bars where you can slide from none to more than i need um, and we'll give you a, a minute or so or half a minute to put some responses in here it'll give us some indication of what the supply looks like um, out there with you so these numbers are, are indicating to us that uh, that you certainly don't have more than you need at this point of, of anything. And um, the, the average line that you see there is 3.8 across all respondents in all categories, um, 3.8 out of 10 um, for your supplies. So that's helpful to know. Um, there's another resource that's available on the CDC website and that is a personal protective equipment burn rate calculator. You can uh, follow the link that's there on the site or just Google CDC PPE burn rate and uh, there you can put in how many staff you have, the amount of supplies that you have, and the type of patient volume that you're seeing and it will help you have an understanding of um, how many days worth of supplies you might have on hand. And to that end, um, here are some ways that you can request PPE for your office. So if you're affiliated with a hospital, your hospital is able to get PPE from their, uh, from their local health care coalition. There are several health care coalitions across the state, and they work closely with those hospital systems and um, have PPE that they can provide to the hospital systems, and then it's the hospital's responsibility to distribute that to their satellite locations or to their providers. If you are not affiliated with a hospital system, you can try contacting your local healthcare coalition. Those are set up by um, geographical region, and there's a link on the site there on the page that you're looking at that will take you to the site where you can see where your local um, healthcare coalition is. You can also try contacting your emergency management agency in your county. Just Google emergency management agency and then your county's name and that should pop up and they may also be able to assist you with um, getting PPE. And then uh, a reminder of a resource that we shared last week, what, what we um, hear sometimes is that um, while folks may have PPE, they may not be well aware of how to don and doff that PPE safely so that they're um, keeping themselves protected. Um, for example, they shouldn't have um, N95 masks hanging around their necks while they're uh, going about their business for the day. So Emory has some really good uh, resources and an infographic form that can be shared on how to don and doff that equipment and the, the link there is on your screen. That may be something that you'll wanna share with your office staff to make sure everyone's doing that safely. There are also a couple of symptom checkers available now for your patients. Uh, one is on the CDC website. The other one is an app that you can get through the, the Apple Store. 
Um, the, even the Apple app was developed with CDC, but um, your patients can go on there and go through a, a number of different questions about their travel history, their health, what types of symptoms they're having, whether or not they've been exposed, and then they'll be given advice whether they should contact their provider immediately or go to an assessment center, whether uh, they're likely safe to remain at home and not necessarily be tested. Those might be helpful resources for you to post on your own websites or to push out to um, the patients that are in your practices so that they can um, do some self-assessment. And then um, a reminder that there are uh, links to remote assessment sites on the state's webpage, so that's at tn.gov. There's a red banner at the top that takes you to the governor's webpage, and if you scroll down, you'll see this blue box that says remote assessment sites, and there you can click on a county, and uh, there'll be a listing of where you can go for a remote assessment or where you can send your patients for remote assessment. That's not necessarily testing, but it's at least someone who's going to talk through them about what their exposures and their symptoms are. And uh, in some of those places, they're able to do testing there. In other places, they'll refer them to someone who can do testing. But uh, all of those are listed there by county. And that information changes um, on a daily basis as more sites come up. So uh, be sure to check back to those sites in your counties frequently um, to see where the local testing uh, and assessment sites are located. Um, as we um, go through this, there have been more and more tests and types of tests that have become available. The test that is still done at the State Department of Health is a PCR test that actually detects the RNA of the virus. There is, as of yesterday, uh, a test that was given emergency use authorization by the FDA and that is a rapid antibody test that uses blood uh, for that test. Um, and so we just wanted to give you a little bit of information about that. This is a test that can be run fairly quickly in about 45 minutes, but it has to be used in a lab that, um, that is um, authorized to do moderate complexity labs. So this is not a point of care test that someone's gonna be able to do in their office in a CLIA waived lab. This is still gonna be uh, a uh, likely a send out kind of test. Um, just a, a few points about antibody testing. Um, these, this particular test, you cannot use a finger stick um, to perform that test. It has to be an actual blood draw. And these antibodies will often cross-react with antibodies for commonly circulating coronaviruses. So a positive test uh, does not confirm a COVID-19 illness and a negative test, um, it does also, also does not exclude a COVID-19 infection. So um, you'll want to be a little bit careful if you use these tests about how they're interpreted. Um, os, os, I can never say this. Oseltamivir. Oseltamivir um, may also cross-react and, and um, affect the results of the testing. So if you have a patient who has been uh, diagnosed with flu and has been given oseltamivir, I did it. Um, <laughs> They, that may impact the result of that test. And then the fine print on these tests is that they should not be used as the, the only tool for um, diagnosis. As a reminder, the State Public Health Lab is still running tests on a daily basis to um, uh, get testing for priority populations. And those are folks who have direct contact with a COVID-19 case those who have traveled uh, to or from a high risk international or domestic location, um, if the individual is pregnant or severely immunocompromised, if they are someone who's in a, a high risk profession like nursing or a physician, um, or if they're maybe a prison guard or someone working in a detention facility where they would have the opportunity to spread the illness to large numbers of people, we want to get those results back as quickly as we can. Um, patients who are hospitalized with severe pneumonia or ARDS uh, where the etiology is unclear and um, those who are in congregate care, who are incarcerated or who have lack of insurance that would pay for a test outside of the state public health lab, all of those populations can have testing run through the state public health lab. You just call our number uh, between the hours of 8 and 8 for authorization from the provider and that number is 615-741-7247 
and you can talk to someone who is here manning the phones who can give you authorization uh, to send that test to the state public health lab. Turnaround for those tests is still about 24 to 48 hours on, on most days. Um, we have a little bit more flexibility with how you can submit specimens to the state public health lab as well. So all you need is a, a polyester or Dacron swab that has a plastic or metal handle. We cannot take um, uh, natural swabs like cotton or handles uh, that are wood as they interfere with the assay. You can either send that swab um, immersed in viral transport media or you can send it in a sterile container with sterile saline. Either one of those will work in our lab as long as that swab remains wet and doesn't have an opportunity to dry out. Um, we should be able to run that through either one of those media. And then there's also a commercial product called an e-swab with Amy's Media that you may have available to you that can also be submitted to the state lab. Those swabs should be nasopharyngeal, lab, uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs. We can also do oral pharyngeal swabs, um, but you only need one swab. And uh, generally what, what is recommended for our lab is a nasal pharyngeal swab. Um, just a reminder too to make sure that you're keeping strict office policies. We continue to see healthcare workers who are exposed to the virus and then are working while they're ill and, um, and having large numbers of people who are exposed, both patients and coworkers. So no one in your office should be coming to work if they feel ill. They should be monitoring their temperatures, uh, making sure they haven't had respiratory symptoms in the last 72 hours, and even diarrhea should be a reason to stay home as that can be an early symptom of COVID-19 as well. They should remain there for 72 hours um, from when they return to wellness. Uh, and really there should be no exceptions to that. If you have staff who are critical workforce who have been exposed to COVID-19, but they are asymptomatic, and do not have a positive test, then they can work as long as they're masked while they're at work. Um, and we realize that that may mean that um, if you have a large number of people on your workforce that test positive, that that may mean having to close your clinic for a period of a week or so. Um, but that's what may need to be done in, in the best interest of keeping this spread from, uh, from the public and others. Um, so please be proactive with your staff. Um, we want to also um, publicize for a moment that you can sign up for the Medical Reserve Corps so that um, should we get to a, a more heightened crisis situation, you can be uh, activated to assist with providing health care to people who are in need. Um, you can do that through the link that's on your slide here, and you, uh, you can sign up as either a medical provider or a non-medical provider uh, or non-medical staff who can um, respond for the COVID-19 um, response here. Um, we also want to talk for a minute about, uh, to those of you who provide immunizations through your offices, we still want to make it a priority to get children immunized on time as you're able to do that so that we can avoid having something like a measles outbreak on top of what is um, already um, this pandemic that we're dealing with now. So we have some um, guidance that will be posted to our web uh, website for providers uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, but we, we urge you to find ways to prioritize immunization for children who are at least two and under so we can get those first immunizations to them. If you have an office that just cannot provide immunizations at this point, then we would ask you to please send those patients to your local health department so that they can try to accommodate them and keep them on schedule. So here's uh, another question for all of you. Um, are you able to immunize patients right now? And um, you either yes, like you always do, uh, yes, but you're prioritizing certain patients, no, you absolutely do not have the bandwidth to provide immunizations right now, or you're just not someone who has ever provided uh, immunizations. That's great that so many of you are, are able to continue to immunize uh, your patients, uh, at least by prioritizing uh, the most urgent of those, that's great. So it looks like about a third of you are, are able to continue to, to immunize your kids and another fourth um, are able to at least do priority patients. Thanks for uh, responding to that.
Okay. And uh, so one more thing we'd like to know is how we can best help you. So uh, we want to make sure that these webinars are valuable to you and that we're answering um, questions that, that you may have. We do try to have about a half an hour to answer your questions at the end of each of these webinars. And then we post those questions to uh, a question and answer document that is on the website uh, where we house the, um, the recorded webinars for these sessions. So um, we're happy to continue to provide you uh, guidance and, and uh, answer your questions as we're able to do so. So thanks for providing us that information as well so we can make sure that we're um, answering the questions that you have. So um, we will turn to start answering some of your questions now and uh, I'll let Dr. Phil answer these first couple that are here. Yeah, so the first question is about a sort of a specific patient scenario, a patient that has some, some sinus or allergy type symptoms that wants to work, an employer wants them to be tested to ensure that they're not infectious. The patient hasn't had fever or cough or shortness of breath or travel. Um, and the question is whether or not to clear them clinically with or without a test. Um, but we have a little more context that there have been a few patients recently seen, I guess, in the same clinic who just had allergy type symptoms that all tested positive for COVID-19. So I think, um, you know, we feel fairly certain that in all parts of Tennessee now there is evidence of community spread of COVID-19. Um, we are also learning more and more about what are uh, the, the typical or common symptoms associated with this disease. You know, much of the data that our original decision making was based on was uh, based on what we learned from colleagues and healthcare uh, workers in China. And now that we're seeing things more in the United States, we I think have a little more granularity to see that not every patient has fever or cough or shortness of breath. Those are still very important criteria to screen with, um, but we certainly realize that there are patients that have more mild symptoms. Dr. Fisk has already mentioned some GI symptoms we're seeing increasingly commonly. Um, people reporting loss of sense of smell or taste. Um, or, you know, we, we do see people that test positive um, preclinically or that, you know, before they've developed any sort of symptoms that they identify. So I think, um, you know, we, we want to be thoughtful about how we utilize testing, but if there's concern about an exposure or concerns about this person working in a setting where they need to know that they're not infectious, and I think testing would certainly not be inappropriate in this case. Um, the next question is around practice size or total amount of loan for loan forgiveness for the Small Business Administration loans. Um, I don't know enough specifically about the specific program to say I don't want to speak incorrectly, but we linked to the website with, with a ton of information about that program in the slides, and so hopefully you can get all those questions answered there. Um, the third question is about the curve that people say looks like it's flattening. Um, I think, so the, the curve that you might be looking at is our state-specific epi curve or epidemic curve, and important to note that that is reported by date of um, specimen collection, uh, which we're using as, as a proxy for symptom onset, as that tends to be a more complete um, data point that we have fairly quickly. Uh, so that data we expect to lag. So if someone was just tested yesterday, it's gonna take several days for us to get those results. Uh, so I don't think that we have enough information right now to say that, that any curve is flattening, but I think we can say without a doubt that the social distancing measures that are in place and encouraged and now mandated by the governor are incredibly important and will have a big impact on the spread of this disease in our communities. So the next question is, when will the state provide proper PPE to outpatient facilities? Um, so at least from the perspective of the Department of Health, we do not have PPE to distribute to um, outpatient facilities, but um, the resources that we presented at the beginning of the webinar to contact your state or your county uh, emergency management agency um, or your local healthcare coalition, they may be able to provide um, proper PPE to you. So if you've not reached out to either of those agencies, um, we would encourage you to do that and, and see if they can assist you. The next is, how do you think uh, a recommendation for all to wear a mask um, will affect how um, the supply of healthcare worker PPE? So, um, I, I'm assuming this is regarding the population all wearing a mask at all times and and you know there is just not enough PPE to go around even surgical masks as um, I think was shown in our our little informal poll at the beginning um, are in short supply so it's um, I, I think it, it's likely that 
a recommendation for all citizens to be wearing masks at all times will impact that. Um, it's possible that those out in the community will wear um, non-FDA approved face masks that may help to preserve some of that supply for the healthcare workers. But um, the we know that some countries have uh, asked all citizens to wear masks at all times, and, and in those countries they've used a varying number of different types of materials to, um, to mask themselves. Yeah, and I would just add to that, I think, um, you know, I think this recommendation is, is really out of an abundance of caution around that potential preclinical or asymptomatic transmission. I think from our perspective in the Department of Health, we will continue to message um, as clearly as we can that, that healthcare worker PPE, medical grade masks are intended for healthcare workers and we really need to try to protect that supply the very best that we can. Um, we also wanna really emphasize that to the general public and you can help with this as you engage with your patients and families and communities that even if you're wearing a mask, a non-medical mask, uh, that does not mean that you need to not continue to social distance, that you can be in larger groups of people, that you can stop doing good, practicing good hand hygiene. There is some evidence to suggest that when people are masked, they actually touch their face more. So really trying to proactively educate people that um, a mask is not, uh, not the all, all protector and we still need to engage in those really important behaviors to prevent transmission otherwise. So uh, another question is, should we screen asymptomatic healthcare workers? Right now, the, our recommendation and, and that of CDC is not to screen asymptomatic individuals. Um, if there's concern in the healthcare um, setting that someone is symptomatic, then they certainly should be um, screened to make sure that they're not spreading that illness to others. Uh, we know that there's a, a number of asymptomatic individuals who are um, infected with coronavirus. The problem is that there just are not enough tests to be able to um, test everyone in the state or everyone even within the healthcare system to be able to um, widely test every healthcare worker. And should an asymptomatic healthcare worker be negative today, that doesn't mean that they would be negative tomorrow. So um, a, a negative is not particularly helpful in that case, nor is a positive in an asymptomatic patient who may still have viral RNA present in their nasopharynx, but may not actually be infectious. So uh, we would still ask that patients who are symptomatic uh, or healthcare workers who are symptomatic be tested. And remember that healthcare workers who are symptomatic um, can be tested through the state public health lab where sometimes turnaround is a little bit faster. There's a question about if we cannot rely on the antibody testing to confirm or rule out COVID-19 infection, then why do the test? That's an excellent question. I think, um, you know, I think we still have a lot to learn about how these tests will be part of our diagnostics and help inform um, information about immunity and the shape of the epidemic. Um, we certainly know that, that testing is is not available widespread, especially in certain parts of the country. I think in Tennessee, um, in many ways, we have, have been in a better shape about testing availability than other states have. Um, however, I think in many areas, they're seeking to use this antibody test because they really don't have anything else available. And so even though it's not perfect, it, it may provide some help in certain scenarios. I think we would still prefer that, that PCR testing be the mainstay, um, especially in certain situations. If there are specific questions about patients or what might be applicable, our clinical line is always happy to help weigh in on that. Um, but I think uh, hopefully we'll have more guidance from CDC and FDA and others in the coming days and weeks about the utilization of these antibody tests and how to really interpret the results um, in the context of, of the limitations that they have. Um, it looks a question, similar question about sensitivity and specificity of the initial screening test. Uh, so we don't have great data right now about uh, sensitivity and specificity, um, mainly because there's not really a gold standard to compare to. There's some evidence from other states and other countries that, um, you know, very early on in infection, maybe when symptoms are mild or not noticed well, <clears throat> that sensitivity could be around 70%, and this is for the, the nasopharyngeal um, PCR type of test, but then that sensitivity is goes up to around uh, 95% or higher, even just a couple of days later, perhaps when symptoms are more obvious. Um, and so we see that sensitivity rises with repeat testing uh, for patients. 
Um, we have not done an analysis of that specifically in Tennessee, again, um, primarily because it's hard to have a gold standard and, and identify who are truly false positives or um, false negatives or true positives or true negatives. Um, so I, I think important for those of you that are doing testing, you know, we, we do still encourage that this really should try to be a nasopharyngeal swab. So that certainly we know that the quality of the, the specimen collection is really important. This should not just be a quick little in and out. We really want to try to get a good specimen if possible, because that undoubtedly will help with the sensitivity of the test. Um, and with regards to specificity, you know, we don't see uh, too many false positives. Um, the assays that have been developed are specific for the novel coronavirus. And again, I'm speaking about the PCR test only. Uh, there have been um, a couple of instances across the state where there have been questions of that. And I would just say, as with anything, it's important to interpret the results of the test given the clinical situation of the patient that you're evaluating and, and what you know about their history. Um, and if there are questions or concerns, especially if it's someone that's high risk, like Dr. Fiscus mentioned, a healthcare worker or um, someone that works in a congregate setting, if you're unsure about their results, we're always um, happy to consult about potentially retesting at the state lab. Um, the next question is what ICD-10 codes are currently suggested for COVID-19 suspected cases? And uh, we do not have that information, but we can look it up and put it on to the Q&A that's posted um, that should be up at the first part of the week. Or you can um, look on 10 Care site, they may have information there, or um, one of the professional societies, AAP, uh, AFP, may have that information there. Um, thoughts on the new Abbott point of care 15 minute test? Um, do you have any information if these have good sensitivity or not? So the Abbott point of care test is also a blood test. Um, I, I don't know if that one can be used um, as a finger stick test. I know the one that did go through FDA um, uh, emergency use authorization cannot be used with a finger stick, so that may impact someone's ability to use this test uh, in, a, in a point of care kind of situation. Um, it has the same kind of complications that the uh, FDA emergency use uh, authorization test has in that the antibodies are not necessarily specific to COVID-19 and could give you uh, readings of antibodies for other circulating coronaviruses. So uh, the fine print on that test is also that it should not be used as the only means of diagnosis uh, or exclusion of that disease in a patient. Um, the next one is that many patients are unable to participate in telehealth visits without the support of a loved one who may be a vector for contagion. Has Governor Lee lifted Tennessee's restriction on telephonic health care? Um, so CMS has uh, allowed for telephonic health care now, so if you have someone who's covered under Medicare, then uh, CMS will cover telephonic health care and you bill that in the same way that you would bill an office visit. I, I spoke with uh, folks from um, TenCare last week who uh, did seem to think that that, I'm sorry, it wasn't TenCare, I spoke with the AAP, sorry, who said that they did think that that would also apply to Medicaid patients, but we're waiting on um, actual guidance from TenCare that they think that they're going to be um, putting together by the beginning of next week. So um, stay tuned for that or reach out to individual insurance companies um, as to whether or not they're going to cover telephonic care. Um, a question about any guidance coming for summer activities. I think, um, you know, right now I think many things are still in a holding pattern. We've provided some consultation to folks that operate camps or activities in, in spring and summer around that, that are having to make decisions now about whether or not to have those activities. And I think uh, while we don't have a crystal ball to predict exactly how this will play out in the United States, we're certainly cautioning people that um, we need to prepare for a marathon and not a sprint in terms of social distancing and, and many of the measures that are in place right now. So I don't have specific answers, but I do think um, we, we should plan to be thoughtful about um, that it will take some time for everything to return to normal um, for us to be as cautious as possible. Um, 
A question about if a patient that is COVID positive has a family member that tests positive, does the original patient have to restart their, their quarantine or their isolation over as a household contact? So our approach has been to say no, um, although we don't yet understand the duration of antibody protection for COVID-19, um, we certainly know that there is some immune and antibody response to infection, as is evidenced by these, these new IgM and IgG assays that are coming onto the market. Uh, so while um, that may be a challenging question to answer if there's a, a six or nine month difference in the, the time of infection, if the family member is um, infected within a, a week or two of the original case, and I think we feel fairly confident that that original uh, patient will have some duration of protective immunity and they would not have to restrict their activities or be specifically quarantined. Um, and then a question about PPE for EMS. Uh, you know, we certainly um, have tried to work closely with our EMS colleagues. We have a state EMS um, uh, position that works with EMS agencies all across the state. And, uh, you know, right now we're encouraging EMS to follow the CDC guidance for personal protective equipment, certainly if they're picking up patients that have respiratory symptoms that could be uh, or other symptoms that could be consistent with COVID-19 that they um, use PPE accordingly. Um, in addition, if public health uh, is doing their contact tracing investigations of, of a confirmed case and there is a question about a potential EMS exposure, they would certainly do outreach to that team uh, to inquire more about what exposures might have happened and provide specific guidance. The next one is, is it okay to do COVID testing if we are not in complete PPE and what's the minimum to do that safely? Um, so it is considered an aerosolizing procedure to do a nasal pharyngeal or oral pharyngeal swab. And so the recommendation is that the person doing the swab have an N95 mask and eye protection and gloves uh, and a gown. Um, and it is possible that if that patient were to come back positive and you were not wearing that specific equipment that you could uh, end up being quarantined or have to work with a mask um, if you were asymptomatic. Uh, as of right now, not having a gown on has not been a reason to quarantine folks, but um, we're certainly concerned about aerosolization of that virus during that procedure and would want to make sure that um, eyewear and, um, and an N95 mask were used. Uh, updates on treatment options and or vaccine. Uh, the vaccine news, the latest is that they expect to be doing clinical trials in September. So likely still a year to 18 months away for uh, a vaccine to be released. We are beginning to plan for that and for the distribution of that. So if you are a licensed provider in the state of Tennessee, you'll be getting an email over um, the course of next week asking you if you would be willing to sign up to be a, a distributor of pandemic supplies, whether that be antiviral medications or vaccine, um, so that we can begin to build our database of the capacity of um, where and to whom we would give that uh, those supplies when they were to become available. So um, watch out for that as it comes out to you over the next week or so, and please consider being someone that signs up to be able to um, receive and distribute those supplies when, when we get them. Um, as far as uh, medications for either prevention or mitigation of infection, um, there are some clinical trials going on with uh, one antiviral medication in particular. Um, those are still in trials. Uh, there's a trial being done at the University of Nebraska on that right now with um, those patients who are more critically ill and hospitalized. Um, there is some limited information about um, hydrochloroquine um, plus or minus azithromycin that has been released, but still no big numbers as far as to the efficacy of those medications and the risk benefit um, relationship of them to, to treating for COVID-19. Yeah, I would just echo that the data for um, hydroxychloroquine is really mainly based on some in vitro studies. There have been a couple of trials done in China, um, but from, from conversations I've had with infectious disease colleagues, I think they're really still seeking additional data um, done in the US system to really understand. Um, it's often hard to interpret some of those trials without understanding um, the, the, the data underlying them. So I know that work is certainly ongoing. 
Um, a question about reusing N95 masks, surgical masks, face shields, and goggles. So uh, there's quite a bit of guidance on our website and on CDC's website about conservation of PPE. There are some strategies to reuse those materials. Um, CDC just released guidance, I think just yesterday, around uh, decontamination of N95s. There have been some um, protocols developed using ultraviolet radiation or other um, modalities to decontaminate um, N95s that have already been used. So there, there are some measures to potentially reuse these. I think, though, we have to be really cognizant of not contaminating our hands or our surfaces or other things when we're taking these measures on and off. And uh, so really important to, to try to be very protocolized and thoughtful about if you're going to reuse an item like that, where it's being stored, how you're taking it off, how you're then putting it back on to ensure that there's not cross-contamination occurring. Um, and, and, I, and I would say, and then the question is sort of, do we stop testing if we don't have supplies? I mean, I think we, we want to protect our frontline healthcare workers the very best that we can. And so we can, we would never uh, encourage people to, to practice in a setting that they don't feel safe or protected in, realizing that if we get sick, then we also potentially put our patients and families and communities at risk. So we certainly recommend that people follow the PPE guidance to the, to the, the best degree that they can to ensure that all of those groups are protected. Uh, the next question is about uh, newborn hearing screening in nurseries for infants that may be under investigation or positive for coronavirus and whether or not they should be screened in the hospital for hearing or um, or whether that needs to be done later. So the, the AAP uh, released guidance yesterday on working with uh, infants who are born to mothers who are COVID positive and, and how to work with them. Um, the recommendation is that people who are uh, working with them be in full PPE when they're doing so because it's still not quite uh, understood what the risk is in working with infants who have that exposure. There have been very small studies done with mixed results. Some have had infants born to mothers um, who are COVID positive who have had positive rectal or nasopharyngeal um, swabs that were um, COVID positive. They seem to clear pretty quickly, but those numbers are again really small, like under 10. So um, it's difficult to know and right now the recommendation is that of an abundance of caution and considering the environment you're working in that you be in full PPE when working with those uh, with those babies. Um, whether or not hearing screening can happen uh, depends on the capabilities of your particular institution. Um, the most important thing would be that if, if uh, the protocol there is not to hearing screen these babies in the hospital that you're keeping track of which ones those are so that in a couple of months when and uh, hopefully we're through the bulk of this, we can make sure that those babies don't fall through the cracks and that they still get their hearing screening done. A question about if testing is going to be ramping up and clearing backlogs, that it's taking too long to get results. So the, the turnaround time on results is really highly variable depending on the laboratory that you're using. So we know that some of the big commercial labs like LabCorp still have a fairly substantial delay in turnaround. I'm hearing anywhere from 7 to 14 days depending on where you are. And I know in different parts of the country, like in California, there are over 50,000 tests that are pending. Um, Fortunately, in Tennessee, I don't think our backlog is nearly that bad, um, but I do know that there's quite a bit of variability among commercial laboratories. So I would say if you are struggling with the commercial laboratory that you're working with, I would encourage you to work through your, your practice manager or your hospital administration to inquire about potentially sending samples to other laboratories. There are now um, many commercial labs across the state, some that are, are based here in Tennessee that are doing testing, especially if some as, as some of the testing kit reagents have been um, more available in, in the last week or so. Um, so I would encourage you to, to look into other options uh, to see if you can find a, 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 an option that ensures more quick turnaround times. And again, if you are taking care of patients that fall into those high-risk categories that we mentioned earlier, we are happy to consult on testing those patients at our state public health laboratory where we have turnaround times of uh, once the specimen is received, one to two days. This next one is um, asking if we will share protocols uh, for outpatient treatment of COVID-19 and we'll follow CDC's guidance on that. So when um, CDC makes recommendations about the treatment of outpatient um, people who are infected with COVID-19 or for 
the prophylaxis for COVID-19, then we'll be sure to be passing those along to you. But, um, but it's their guidance that we follow as far as um, treatment recommendations. Um, a question about the status of the strategic national stockpile and, um, and chloroquine. Um, so the, you know, the, the strategic national stockpile has been a mechanism by which we've distributed personal protective equipment to the eight healthcare coalitions in Tennessee. Those distributions have, have happened. And, um, and as we already talked about, if you're part of a larger hospital system, um, that's an, an option for those systems to access PPE um, as it is available. I saw the announcement that there were going to be some medications pushed into the SNS, but I have not heard um, any updates on distribution to Tennessee. Um, so I, I think we're still waiting to get additional information about the timeline of that, and we'll certainly keep everyone updated. Um, a question about the types of swabs that can be used for uh, for doing test collection. You know, Dr. Fiscus already walked through the requirements about it being a non-cotton synthetic or um, Dacron swab that it must be a metal or plastic shaft. Um, the question is whether you could use vaginal swabs or other swab types that are maybe not marketed for an NP swab but um, might be made of those appropriate materials. I think from, from our perspective, as, as long as it meets those specifications of the, the type, the swab tip, and then the, the shaft of the swab, um, that's fine. I think we just have to be thoughtful about the area that we're swabbing and if the size of the swab is conducive to actually collect a specimen in a way that's not um, gonna be overly uncomfortable for the patient. So I think that would be the only other thing I would consider. Um, and a question about mid-turbinate swabs and a, a protocol that perhaps has been put into place at Seattle Children's. Um, I haven't seen the data on that. As we spoke about a little bit before, I think uh, we know that the, the sensitivity of the test is best when we can get a really good specimen. Um, I would be interested to, um, to, to see the, the data behind their recommendation and, and certainly, um, the, you know, these are, we want everyone to get the best swab possible. Um, and I think probably many of the swabs that we're getting and testing now are probably mid turbinate swabs based on what I've heard from talking to friends or colleagues who have been tested themselves. So um, we're happy, I'm happy to look into that protocol and provide an update um, on the next call or in the FAQs. Um, the next question is who determines uh, what qualifies it as, a, as an essential procedure? So there is some guidance online, both uh, at CDC and on our website, about uh, determination of essential procedures. And uh, basically, the the easy, uh, quick and dirty rule on that is if the patient uh, can safely wait and will not be significantly compromised by putting a procedure off, then that procedure should be put off. Um, so routine endoscopies, colonoscopies, um, uh, procedures that don't have to happen right now where the, the outcome of the patient would not change one bit if it was done two months from now or three months from now compared to this week um, should be pushed off. For those procedures where the patient is in significant discomfort, um, then those procedures should still be considered and certainly for any procedure where the, the outcome of the patient would be significantly compromised by delaying that, then, then that would be considered an essential procedure. How do we handle elderly patients who need assistance? What about social distancing? So um, hopefully elderly patients um, who need assistance are in a situation where they're, they're um, isolated at home for the most part anyway, so really the danger to them is going to be people coming into the home to provide them assistance. Um, certainly, if, if that caregiver is someone who is symptomatic, they need to stay away until they're assessed or until they've returned to wellness for at least 72 hours. Um, it, if they've had a known exposure, they need to stay away for that 14-day quarantine period so as to um, be sure not to put that person at risk. Um, if there are ways to assist that person and, and yet make sure that um, you're minimizing what they're exposed to, so if, if you can use gloves or um, use a mask to maybe try to protect that person, it's certainly within reason to do so with whatever supplies that you happen to have available to you. Um, certainly we've seen outbreaks across nursing home settings where We've had those providers who have needed to provide care to um, elderly individuals, and uh, it's, it's very clear that they're at risk uh, for getting the infection and for having um, very poor outcomes 
if they are to be infected. So uh, I think every um, amount of caution that can be given and, and still get their needs met is, is something that should be done. And that is the end of the questions that we have right now. So um, again, we invite you to uh, reach out to us through um, social media. You can uh, comment on the Tennessee Department of Health Facebook pages or Twitter as to whether or not these um, things are, are helpful to you. We'll plan on having another update next Friday at noon, uh, just as we have for the last month. And um, we'll be happy to look at all of the comments that you've put into the Menti to help guide us uh, as far as what other information we can provide to you during these hours that we have together. Um, we've got one more question. Are we supposed to have a letter with specific number as medical providers for travel during the stay at home order? Um, there is nothing at this point to provide to people to prove that they're essential um, workers and, and need to be traveling about. Um, I have had friends already reach out to me this morning that they've been stopped by state troopers um, who have asked if they're essential employees and uh, and their reason for needing to be out traveling and then they've been allowed to to continue on so um, as of right now there's nothing that we're providing certainly having a hospital badge or um, something with you that would show that you're a healthcare worker would uh, help in that situation but we've not been given any other guidance as far as um, specific documentation that you need so with that, we will um, sign off for this week and look forward to seeing you next time, next Friday at noon. Uh, and in the meantime, please be sure to check the website, www.tn.gov health. Click the yellow banner at the top for COVID-19 updates. Scroll down to the healthcare provider section where you'll find uh, these recordings of our archived webinars, the Q&A that we put out and then a, a slew of documents that we add to every day that will hopefully help you in taking care of these patients in your community. So thank you for all you're doing. Hang in there and we'll see you next week. Thank you.